so um, kind of just did the the check in. I'll uh, whoops, here we go. What's going on here? Okay, so uh, we have completed this week. If you're quote unquote on schedule, uh, you would have completed this week uh, course the first week of course three which is focused on data transformation and feature engineering. Um, for Eric and uh, Victor, if you're just getting started as well, um, we have been following along with the uh, enterprise workflow specialization sequence, uh, kind of along at the pace recommended by the course, which is, uh, two weeks per course and this is the rough agenda that the courses have followed uh, the first course really focused on data ingestion getting our data in and cleaning it up the second course focused on topics related to exploratory data analysis uh, and some statistical topics around hypothesis testing and this third course is really focused on transforming and manipulating data. Uh, sorry, uh, is there any like a uh, material that I can review and or preview? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So are you already enrolled in the course itself? I, I might have missed that, oh, okay. I may have missed that. Okay, then they will dig out. Thanks for pointing out. Okay, yeah, so I can, uh, actually the best, probably the best catch up resource is here. This is the program page on the Tuomo website. Um, and this is a, uh, this is kind of our YouTube playlist that um, all of these sessions recordings get uh, put on. So uh, course one, two, I mean, course one, week one, week two. Um, oh, this is what week one, week two, week course two, week one, course two, week two. Uh, if you go to the YouTube channel, there's also uh, a recording of a webinar that I did with Ray Lopez, who's one of the instructors for the sequence. And that would give you a good idea of what the sequence is uh, all about. Uh, but the overview is that it's really focused on, um, you know, it's targeting uh, folks with data science experience and helping them uh, level up their skills such that they're comfortable with the kinds of issues that arise when working in an enterprise environment. So uh, that you know ranges from um, really focusing on repeatable processes when you're doing things like data ingestion to you know understanding how to communicate your results. Um, you know how to deal with um, you know, issues that arise in data transformation when you're working at scale. Um, and then we'll get into, in the next course, you know, things like uh, evaluating model evaluation and then deploying models. Um, and then, you know, there's more on deploying models, you know, with um, tools like Spark and Kubernetes. So that's kind of an overview of the, the sequence. Um, and again, twimalai.com slash AIEW is how to get to that, um, that page with the playlist. So the, uh, hey, good morning, Jess. How are you feeling? Good morning. Uh, I'm feeling okay. I'm hanging in there. Good, good, good. And Rong Sheng joined as well good morning good morning uh so we're just getting started uh with the learning objectives for 
this uh, course three, the first week of course three. Um, this, this course is really, again, focused on feature engineering and transformation. Uh, and so you know, one of the objectives is that we're able to uh, discuss the various issues that arise in, the, in feature engineering in the context of building out AI workflows. Uh, we spend some time talking about the various tools that are available to help address issues like uh, class imbalances. Um, there is a brief mention in this first week around ethical considerations regarding bias and data and some readings on uh, facial recognition, ethical implications of facial recognition in particular. Um, it's quite a bit of time spent on dimensionality reduction for exploratory data analysis as well as transformation. Uh, topic modeling is the subject of the big case study, uh, so quite a bit of, uh, on topic modeling um, for in the context of NLP uh, as well as visualization of uh, textual data. Any questions about the learning objectives for this week of the course? All right, so um, I've got a kind of handful of uh, slides that just run through key takeaways, and you know, my key takeaways from the course. Uh, and I'll be opening it up for discussion, or it's, you know, it is open for discussion throughout. Uh, so please add um, your, your own observations. The, um, the week really begins with the discussion of the different, uh, SK Learn is a big focus, the, the, the big tool that we focus on um, in the course in general, and then this week in particular. Uh, of course, there are others, but um, the the course materials do emphasize, you know, get learn, getting to understand the various interfaces of SK Learn, and uh, in particular, uh, the idea of transformer, estimator, and predictor interfaces. Um, and uh, you'll see it, you'll see these come up in the coding examples. Uh, quite a bit um, with the note that they can be combined. So uh, we'll see uh, fit and transform uh, used several times. Um, but this is really, uh, you know, I've kind of used these interfaces uh, quite a bit in, you know, going through courses and working with SK Learn and never really thought about how they fit together. So I like that they forced us to kind of step back and, and take a look at the, the various pieces. Um, <clears throat> big part of the, uh, this session is focused on dealing with class imbalance. And I actually really like this uh, diagram, even though it is probably the most confusing, confusing version of kind of your uh, binary classification confusion matrix uh, that you might ever want to see. Um, but get the chat window open here. Um, I'm chip in and say I've got this thing pinned because I love this so much. Yeah, yeah, no, it's awesome. Um, so, you know, we usually just see, you know, this stuff here, right, with the true positives, false positive, false negative, true negative, and your type one and type two errors. Uh, and then, you know, if you're getting fancy, you'll kind of, you know, be thinking about precision and recall and maybe your F1 score, but there are all of these uh, various metrics that you can use to really drill down on the relationships between uh, your classes. Um, I thought this was a really great, uh, great picture. Has any, anyone on the call ever used any of these other uh, less common metrics in, in their work or study? Well, I will make one little comment. One of the um, 
surprising things. I, I probably everyone else has, knows this, but um, an, an interesting thing to play is go uh, create a uh, true positive and false positive, then go change the number of items that are in, let's say, condition negative, um, but, but still keeping your false positive rate um, or your specificity actually um, right. So we are often looking at uh, sensitivity and specificity comparisons. But if you change the number, keeping your uh, specificity still the same, um, you'll, you'll miss out on some things that like the F1 score will reveal because it's able to kind of cross, um, cross across the column, so to speak. But just a little exercise you might try sometime. So what's an example of a situation where you've seen that? Or an example of a kind of data that you, you would apply that to? Um, so in, in a lot of our binary classification systems, so uh, in the medical field, if we're looking at trying to have a um, diagnosis of some disease, um, um, if you look at some of the reporting and they're only done in terms of uh, specificity and sensitivity, which is often the case, you may kind of miss out on the implication of prevalence. So that's a common problem where you might look at a, a drug, for instance, or a therapy or um, an image classifier. Uh, and if you don't take into account prevalence, um, you get a distorted picture of what's going on. And the best way to understand that is, is really just run some experiments yourself with mock data using using this, um, you know, using this table. Got it. Cool. Very cool. Uh, yeah, so they, so that really falls under this, you know, first piece of general guidance, which is really understanding the implications of the, the various uh, cost functions, um, the course, uses or presents the simple example of um, you know, accuracy, or accuracy versus precision recall or F1 score in the case of um, a, uh, you know, a class imbalance where you've got your, uh, your, um, I forget the example that they, the specific example that they use, but, um, where you're, you've got a very small quantity of positive examples and you're, uh, if you're using an accuracy metric, um, your uh, model can just predict uh, positive all the time and be, or predict negative all the time rather, and be highly accurate, 99% accurate. Um, but that's obviously not uh, a useful model. And so that, kind of speaks to you know, choosing the appropriate loss function um, as a, a first step. Uh, another step is adjusting your training data by upsampling or downsampling. Uh, and the point is emphasized quite a bit that um, you know, downsampling is easiest, uh, but you do have the issue of losing data. Um, upsampling is quite a bit more challenging. Uh, we don't, I don't think in the, any of the examples, um, they don't have us walk through any or use any of these functions, but they present uh, a long list of various techniques that can be used for upsampling. And there's some discussion around them. Uh, these are things like SMOT and ADASIN and SMOTENC uh, and others. There's not a lot of detail uh, in the course on these, but there are links to various places in uh, the scikit-learn docs. Uh, quick note is it's important to be careful to split your train and test sets first. Uh, happened across an interesting recent example of uh, what can happen if you don't in this article, um, I think this was just a few days ago, rookie data science mistake invalidates a dozen medical studies. Uh, basically, um, some study upsampled before they did their train test split. So they've got 
And basically they're doing random upsampling. So copying their uh, underrepresented positive multiple times so that it's better represented in their data set. Uh, but they did that before the split. And uh, as a result of that, they um, have uh, copies of their training data essentially in their test set. Um, so their models are you know, memorizing that and performing exceedingly well, uh, too well in fact. And there's a great quote in here. Uh, this, is a, this is a mistake that uh, many of us make. I guess what's, what distinguishes a good ML researcher is the fact that you should always be skeptical about near perfect results. Thought that was quite funny. Um, uh, so then if the, the last point on class imbalance here is that um, they discussed the, you know, that some methods are more sensitive than others to class imbalance, neural nets being an example of a uh, model type that is very sensitive to it, whereas SVMs and tree methods uh, can be much more resilient to it. Any uh, thoughts or, or comments on class imbalance? Just that I think this really highlights the importance of quality data because these are all really complicated responses to having such a class imbalance. And sometimes there are such really good reasons for it that it's hard not to have it depending on what, what, it, what you're actually looking at in the population. Mm -hmm. um, but in some ways, it seems like, you know, a data engineer would think to themselves, wouldn't it be easier just to somehow <laughs> find a way to get balanced classes? Yeah, or I think to that, similarly, uh, if you can get enough data so that you can meet your goals with downsampling, you know, it can be quite a bit easier than some of these other yeah. tools and a little bit less prone to, to errors. Yeah, exactly, because it, it, it always, even if you pick a great method, it always has a little bit of a feel of, you know, you've, you've, you've really changed this data set somehow. I mean, you're doing something to compensate, and so it kind of brings a little question mark to it. Yeah, and I think if you're, we didn't really talk about that as much in this uh, module, but in the last one, um, I think they made, the point clear that like if you're really doing this thoroughly, you know, all of these techniques that you are attempting, you can consider them as hyperparameters and, you know, you should be validating them against one another to see, you know, which of them works best and they all have their own parameters. So the, uh, the complexity can, you know, can grow pretty significantly. Yeah, and I also find myself wondering, you know, as, as you're describing that, that, you know, if this was a context of healthcare system or health research or academic research, you, you could really go through those paces. But I wonder in industry if you'd really be, you know, unable to have enough time to really go through all of that, or if you would just, you know, actually not be doing that, picking the one that made the most sense to you and just taking it forward if it seemed reasonable. Yeah, yeah, I thought your comment last week was right on target. Like, ideally, you would have some flowchart that said, you know, if this situation, then use this. If this situation, then use this. If you know you're you're here, then try these two things. Um, but uh, most of the time, you know, either we don't have that uh, flowchart because no one's made it yet, or you know, more likely because the lines aren't quite that clear. Um, and there are a lot of dependencies on, you know, things like your data and distributions and all those kinds of things. Uh, and so you kind of try, you know, you try stuff and depending on how mission critical your problem is, that kind of dictates, you know, how much you try. Um, the, uh, I think one of the points that they do reinforce here is uh, that these are, you know, all of these things that we're talking about are kind of further reasons to use features like SK Learns pipelines or other wise build kind of repeatable pipelines so that as you 
you know, if you need to test multiple things against one another, you can be sure that you're uh, isolating the thing that you're actually trying to test and not, you know, if you're doing it ad hoc, you know, changing other things and somehow messing up your testing. Um, that's a point that they bring up quite a bit in here, um, just due to its importance. I got a quick question, uh, if you don't mind. Please. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, can, could you educate me what is a small NC and uh, what is the pros and cons with the, the, the other two in front of them? Yep. Yeah, we'll thanks. go to the, uh, to the course for that. If I remember correctly, the SMOT NC has to do, it's better for nonlinearities. Um, let me try to remember where. Oh, my bad. If it's already covered in earlier sessions, then I will, I will review it. Well, no, it's, it's, uh, it's in this material. So this is this, the session that we're supposed to be working on. I'm just looking for, actually, I might have it in my notes. Uh, wow, you got a very good note. <laughs> apparently not good enough. Oh, wait, here we go. Yeah, so. Oh, These are the, uh, the various oversampling uh, techniques. So SMOT is synthetic minority oversampling technique. Right. Uh, and Adison is adaptive synthetic sampling method. They didn't really, uh, the impression I was left with was that SMOT was kind of the default. And uh, these are uh, kind of variations. And they referred off to uh, doc pages and wiki pages for details that I didn't really spend a lot of time on. Um, but this particular one, the, uh, the smote and yeah, that's what it is. It's, uh, if you've got a mixture of categor categorical and continuous features, uh, smote ah. and C is a extension to smote that allows you to deal with that. Okay. Okay. Got it. I've often thought a really great uh, volunteer project would be to have a group of people that went through Wikipedia and found formulas such as these and then just added an in plain English section to just all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, you know, for better or worse, the course relies heavily on links to Wikipedia, which um, for some topics, you know, it, it's good. And for other topics, you know, it dives right into, you know, math and formulas and can be a little bit difficult to parse. Yeah, I'm going to create the, uh, the IPE Society and it's just going to go through Wikipedia and just, uh, <laughs> you know, I see, I see a link back to the, to the IPE Society with some, like, anonymous type mask logo <laughs> with, <laughs> math, with math symbols on it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so... Let's see. So Cla any other thoughts or questions on class imbalance? So at the risk of saying something again, that's already been covered. Um, are, are we going to talk about the uh, minority representation issue here or in the next section? Uh, I think that comes up in class imbalance, but you know, feel, go ahead, go right ahead. So I was just going to add the comment that, um, so I work in dermatology images area, mm -hmm. and this is a big problem that's been identified um, by everyone who plays in this field, that we recognize that almost all the images we have of melanoma or skin cancer are pretty much Caucasian oriented. So mm -hmm. um, all of these great results have been published over the last three years about being able to detect skin cancer, always have to have this asterisk that skin cancer in the predominantly white population. Yeah, so I did not include any slides on this, but there is a, uh, I don't know why I can't find anything in the, uh, in this overview today. There is a 
brief discussion of some of those kinds of issues in the context of facial recognition. Uh, am I in the right class? I'm in the right class. Am I making that up? It, it, that was in this lesson, right? Yeah, At the introduction, you commented on that, so it must be. <laughs> uh, here it is. It's this quick paragraph here in at the a quick reading at the end of the class and balance uh, and bias section there's a reference to um, this diversity in faces work that uh, is really interesting so um, this I don't know if you've all come across uh, you know this issue and some of the work that um, has been going on here, but uh, a couple of researchers, Joy Bulamwini and Timnit Gebru, uh, wrote a paper called Gender Shades a couple of years ago that basically um, did some testing of various um, cloud based facial uh, recognition services, um, many of which uh, you know, try to estimate uh, gender and age and things like that. And they uh, catalog really interesting results in terms of the performance of these systems uh, for uh, different categories of faces, white faces, black faces, lighter faces, darker faces, um, and uh, presented these results to the various uh, cloud providers and providers of these services and, um, you know, <laughs> caused a little bit of a kerfuffle, I guess, uh, you know, and, and really, I think, brought this issue to, to light. Um, and the, the various uh, providers have been um, to you know, varying degrees, uh, you know, looking at their services and trying to figure out how they can do better uh, in this regard. Uh, but it's really interesting work that is um, you know, worth digging into. There's a little bit of, there's a little video here and there's a, a paper um, that is based on IBM's response to this. The original uh, Gender Shades work um, is at uh, gendershades.org. Uh, Joy has an, or an organization called uh, Algorith Algorithmic Justice League. It's doing really interesting work in the broader area of uh, AI ethics, um, but you know, focused on some of this, uh, some of the work that uh, started with the Gender Shades paper. So a lot of really interesting stuff here, but um, to your point, Tracy, the, this is an issue that, you know, has come up, um, you know, it, it comes up in uh, medical imaging, it comes up in um, you know, very similar issues um, come up in like NLP and word to back where you've got kind of these classic examples of these systems misbehaving when you do um, the uh, kind of the word to back algebra, like man is to uh, computer scientist as woman is to, and it, the, you know, based on the data set that the algorithm is trained on may say something like homemaker. Um, and, you know, these are all based on, uh, or often based on issues related to class imbalances and minority classes and things like that. So, it, thinking about the, the, the bias in NLP, then it's pretty obvious that that's, that's coming from the systemic bias in the corpus itself, right? Which is coming from the systemic bias in society. With the imaging, 
is it coming from a lack of data about all different types of people? Or is it actually uh, something flawed in the, in the training of the models besides related to making sure that you have enough representative data? Are we talking about the medical imaging case or? No, like, like say in the, in the gender shades. In the gender shades case, um, <clears throat> I think the, the contention is that it comes from um, a lack of diversity in the data sets. Okay, so once again, it comes back into that, that data pipeline. I've heard of a couple of botched attempts to, to get more representative data, like paying people on the street um, you know, to, to image their faces and uh, going to Africa and doing all sorts of things that are probably not well, I actually. We, I think the, the, the botch in that attempt that you're referencing is that the people that were paid on the street were not told that their faces were going to be included in some data set. Exactly. It was, right. yeah, exactly. Yeah. It all comes down to um, you're finding a source for some data, but that source does not know what they're agreeing to. And so they've agreed to something. It's just not, they haven't agreed to the actual use you're going to use that for. So you're swapping one ethical issue for another. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So you have a better algorithm, which may, you know, help people at the end, but you've gotten it by, uh, you know, not very honest means. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I'm just curious, any thoughts in terms of the, the medical community, if, you know, in um, regarding solutions, like how to, how to go about even tackling this? So I um so I oversee uh, OHSU's Mole Mapper uh, program, which is an app to track your skin, uh, track moles and spots on your skin, and it's an IRB approved app, which if you consent um, allows you to upload your images to the cloud. We use a Sage Bioinformatics uh, platform. Um, they uh, this was one of the original research kits. That's the one. And uh, we have found it still difficult to get a proper representation from uh, across different, you know, class types, if you will. Uh, so it's an interesting problem we thought would be solved by sort of crowdsourcing the data, but um, we're still not there yet. Tracy, is it, just as a follow-up question, do you guys know why you're not like getting the data you want like is it i guess something that jumps out to me it says right available on the app store but there's a lot of people with android phones for example who you might get more of um or a diversity of data from like do you guys know what what are sort of the barriers that you're running into in order to get the the broth the breadth of data that you want we kind of know qualitatively but not quantitatively so it's a mixture of a lot of issues issue number one like you say android um, we don't have a large enough team, uh, consists basically of me and another individual right now to be able to do, uh, we had an Android version, but the diversity of hardware on Android makes it really difficult to get consistent um, image data sets. Uh, secondly, uh, there's just the whole issue of it requires a higher end smartphone. And so right away, you've done some kind of bad things in terms of segmenting your population. Uh, that's a problem we're not sure how to get around, actually. So issues of s how you select the population based on the hardware that's required, um, issues of being able to support a broader diversity of hardware. Um, and then, unfortunately, uh, these apps, if they're not super, super easy to use, um, people just kind of you know, in the app space, people will use it for a little bit and then, hey, I'm not interested anymore. And this is particularly problem problematic for something like this app where you're asking people to use it every one to three months, maybe. And it's really hard to establish a habit pattern for something like that. Yeah, it sounds like it's like a, an engagement challenge, like figuring out how you get people to, whether it's to engage in, want to engage in it on, on an ongoing basis. Right, it's chicken and egg. So for instance, let's say we had, um, we believe that we had enough uh, data to have a mole assessment, not just capture images and monitor yourself, but if we actually gave some kind of medical recommendation. Now suddenly we've just entered into the million dollar um, FDA approval cycle. Um, 
but we can't get there until we get enough data, but we can't get enough data until we provide utility to people that makes them want to use the app. So it is definitely a bit of a chicken and egg problem. Yep. And that's how the field of behavioral health economics was born. And I've just realized that we're probably neighbors uh, if you're at OHSU because I'm, I'm in the area as well. Well, hi, neighbor. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, that's an interesting problem. I'm curious for that, for that particular app, where are you putting the, um, the opt-in or the consent point? Is it just right as they have installed the app and they go to use it, they presented with that they opt in? And yeah, and then they, yeah. Okay. it's definitely opt-in. So yeah, as soon as they uh, download the app, we tell them all the wonderful things they could do to help us and see if they're interested in doing it. And then the goal is to, part of the um, IRB, which people on this call will be interested in, the goal is once we do a curation pass on the data, um, we're going to make that open. We're gonna uh, you know, publish that and make that available on the Sage platform for other people to begin to research. It's just unfortunately going to be uh, pretty much unlabeled data at this point because the premise was people would measure the mole, eventually they'd have a mole removed uh, because it was deemed dangerous by a clinician. Then we would ask them to report, you know, what was the result of that. And then anonymously we would bind the results to the images in a de-identified way and make that available. But we're getting almost zero response on the, um, on the follow-up for removed moles. So instead we have some interesting opportunities to look at data in other ways, which we're trying desperately to get to, to get a paper out and et cetera, et cetera. Are you using anything like federated learning or any like uh, methods like that for improving the model while using uh, the privacy we don't method have as well? Yeah, so the right now, the only stuff that we're going to really be doing is clustering. So we have a project um, starting up where we want to actually, there's been some work done, and I'm sorry, I'm derailing this conversation. We should get back to the class. But uh, in <laughs> fact, I probably will just leave it there because we should get back to the class. So um, I can chat af offline about <laughs> some of that stuff. Okay. All right. Um, well, no, I, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, this is primarily a, a discussion oriented uh, session as, you know, our study groups tend to be. We do want to stay on track, but I think, you know, we've seen, um, you know, that what folks most want is to hear how other folks are using this stuff. So we want to make sure to, you know, keep those, keep those conversations flowing. Uh, but with that said, the, you know, that was class imbalance and some of the bias issues. Um, the next section or module really focused on dimensionality reduction. Um, the course presented a number of applications of dimensionality reduction, both from kind of a use case perspective, things like image analysis, text analysis, signal processing, astronomy and medicine as areas where it frequently arises, but also uh, some of the things that it can help you accomplish. And so uh, those examples, and we see these in uh, the, some of these in the case study are um, you know, helping with visualizing high dimensional data, uh, removing collinearities or redundancies in your features, uh, dealing with the curse of dimensionality. So um, reducing the sparsity in your data, uh, identifying the identifying structure uh, in your features for supervised learning via um, methods like non-native matrix factorization, autoencoders, self-organizing maps. Uh, in the course, we talked about where, let's go. Um, let 
there are a bunch of dimensionality reduction techniques that are introduced or mentioned uh, in the course. Um, AIC, BIC for um, generally linear models, uh, ANOVA, lasso regression, neural nets, um, matrix decomposition based methods. Uh, the course primarily focused on PCA uh, under, you know, as a matrix decomp method. Um, and there uh, is a little bit of some mentions of uh, TSNI, uh, and it is the extra credit uh, question in the project relates to using TSNI for visualization. Um, but we're kind of, as in some of the previous modules, we're kind of presented with a, you know, a laundry list of techniques here and um, you know, it's left to the reader to kind of dig into either the SK Learn docs or Wikipedia or what have you to understand how to differentiate between these and uh, where the, um, you know, where the differences are between them. I think, um, <clears throat> you know, certainly for uh, matrix decomposition, PCA, um, is kind of a standby uh, and is very frequently used um, for NLP and uh, topic modeling. LDA is kind of a standby and starting place. Um, these others I'm not as familiar with. Uh, does anyone use any of these others uh, regularly or come across them in any particular context? No takers on that one. Uh, so the the uh, <clears throat> one of the videos goes through a uh, example of doing dimensionality reduction for visualization using Fashion MNIST. Uh, they they don't. Um, this is another one where the code isn't available um, via the course, but I'm happy to share it. Yeah, I copied it into a notebook and I'm happy to share it with anyone that wants to play with it. Um, with this example, basically what you're doing is you are loading in the Fashion MNIST data set. Um, Fashion MNIST, if I remember correctly, is uh, 60,000 images that are broken up into 10 classes. The classes are t-shirt slash top, trouser, pullover, dress, coat, sandal, shirt, sneaker, bag, ankle boot. This is uh, kind of an example of what the images look like. They're 24 by 24 uh, images um, or 28 by 28. Um, and so we're pulling these images in, just kind of displaying them. Um, <clears throat> we're uh, subsetting the data. So first scaling the value. So going from the 255 um, based uh, pixels to uh, zero to one, uh, and then subsetting the data. So this is basically um, only looking at the first five classes. Then uh, vectorizing the images and presenting some, uh, some basic information. Basically, the classes are balanced. Uh, so half of the images is 3,000 um, in these five classes, and the classes are balanced. <clears throat> and then we're doing uh, I don't know how this got there. Um, so doing uh, PCA to um, is this the one that is working? Let's see. I think things may have gotten 
move it around this particular cell. Uh, and okay, so we're doing PCA, we're um, fitting PCA on the training data set and plotting it. Um, and then um, there's some mention that that's basically this plot and there's some discussion in the notes about how um, the, uh, you know, trouser and dress are kind of commingled a little bit. Uh, but you can differentiate them. Uh, T-shirt is, you know, very easy to distinguish from, you know, trouser and dress. Uh, coat and pullover are kind of, you know, hard to differentiate here. The uh, video in the course also does a 3D projection of this, um, which the code for that wasn't provided and I didn't replicate it. Um, and <clears throat> so the idea being simply that we can, um, you know, we've got uh, all of these images. The images are the 784 pixel vectors, but we can reduce it uh, down to this. We can use this two dimensional PCA to plot this into two components and get a sense of, um, you know, and see like distinct patterns in these uh, various classes. And then later on, we see that when we're building the model that uh, our results are uh, fairly consistent with uh, what we're seeing in the reduced dimension plot and that pullover and coat are um, you know, a lot more difficult to resolve than trouser and uh, you know the other classes resulting in reduced uh, precision recall and F1 scores. Uh, there's a brief mention of this cumulative explained variance plot, which you can use to help optimize how many components um, you use in your uh, PCA. Not a lot of detail there, but uh, interesting thing to follow up on. Uh, and then here where <clears throat> the actual implementation of this introduces the idea of using pipelines for uh, repeatability. Any questions on this example or the Notebook. I think that's really helpful, Sam. I appreciate you walking through. I remember watching that video and just thinking there's so much to dig into in this section. Um, when you say you can make it available, are, are you able to email this to us or do you put it on the website? How do you, where, where will you make uh, it? You know, after I'll um, go through and uh, take the notebooks, um, I'll take my notebooks and put them up on a GitHub or something like that. There's one from the last lesson as well um, that I can uh, put up and then I'll send the link uh, via Slack. Does that work? Perfect, thanks. All right, cool. Uh, so that was the that's the fashion MNIST example. Uh, the next uh, project is the, uh, the case study. Um, and uh, so this one basically is, you know, our, uh, our cover story is that uh, at Avail, where we've recently enabled comments on the streaming service, and we want to um, explore the topics in the comments so that we, or do some um, topic modeling on the comments so that when we meet with our domain experts, they can give us some insight into uh, the data that might help us with feature engineering. <clears throat> but uh, basically, what we're doing is we're using uh, the movie review data set. So 
First, you've got to download that to your local directory. <clears throat> um, and so the first step is to load that uh, up and then you can uh, you know, print it out, take a look at a, the, the first uh, review. Hey, Sam. Um, yep. Uh, can you quickly show where you find the file? Because I wasn't able to download it. Oh, yeah. So uh, I think it was just at this link. And then I did a search for movie review. And it's here. OK. Because that's the one I look at, too. I mean, there are like two folders. But I wasn't sure which one or which files that you will be using the, in the exercise. Okay, so uh, yeah, this uh, at this link, this download movie review data brings you to the NLTK uh, data sets page. And then um, I just downloaded this and moved it to a data directory. Um, and then unzipped it, and then you get uh, the negative and positive classes. And this is probably going to take a long time because there are a lot of them. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, so this is what it looks like. Um, the the uh, notebook does expect that the, uh, the data gets put in a data directory at the same level as wherever you, you're running your notebook from. Uh, and then a movie reviews folder under there. Okay. Um, right. Thanks. Yep. Uh, so this is what one of these uh, one of these reviews looks like. Um, you know, save. Uh, you know, note to yourself that you've got these control characters in here. That it's a binary. Uh, a binary, uh, I'm sorry, a byte uh, object. Uh, we'll come back to that. Um, so there's a, uh, I'm going to point out a couple of things that I did that are different from the solution document, which is included. <clears throat> One is that, um, so it walks you through, uh, it basically provides this lemmatized document function, which uh, takes a doc. This is an example of a, a doc. Um, and it uh, uses the spacey uh, tool to stem and lemmatize. It removes stop words from uh, a set. Uh, and then it um, gets rid of punctuation, uh, removes, um, it has a remove unicode step here. Uh, it didn't seem to work for me for dealing with the binary, or so, sorry, the byte uh, object type. Uh, then you're running through the doc with uh, Spacey doing some limitization here uh, and converting everything to lowercase. Uh, in the in the document, you can see here that uh, you get these. Uh, what one of the things that Spacey does as part of the uh, stemma stemming and lemmatization process is replaces. Uh, pronouns like you, he, she with pron. Um, they don't get rid of those. Uh, I got rid of those by adding, um, you know, t not equal to pron here. Uh, <clears throat> I also found that when I um, when I processed using this function as is, I got a B character at the beginning of the first word because it wasn't handling the, uh, the bytes correctly. So I uh, do this conversion of bytes to string before processing. And also you'll notice that 
when uh, you look at the tokens, you'll see things like and the and uh, nin and nit and some other ones. And the reason for that is because it's um, the solution they provide doesn't deal with the uh, these control characters. So I also uh, just got rid of those. Uh, so then you get a cleaned uh, stemmed lemmatized doc without stop words. You may notice here that I have words like movie, film, like make good. That comes from later in the exploration when we get to this Pi L. Davis, uh, which we'll talk about in a sec. Um, but basically what you're doing here is you've got uh, X is the um, list of all of your documents that you've read in from the movie reviews data set and then um, creating a new array and processing all of those documents through this limitized document function and uh, these couple of extra things here to give you your list of processed documents. Uh, and then <clears throat> you're uh, vectorizing the tokens. Uh, so basically you're using this count vectorizer that they tell you to use um, with a uh, maximum number of features of a thousand. This is basically like doing a bag of words, uh, term frequency type of analysis. Um, here we're getting counts um, by fit, doing a fit transform on the vectorizer. <clears throat> this is one of the examples that I mentioned previously where uh, with uh, SKLearn, you, some of the um, functions combine the prediction and estimation uh, interfaces. So we've got these counts now, and then we can print out uh, a vector of the feature names, uh, as well as a vector of the counts. They call this in a solution TF, like term frequency, uh, but they don't ever divide by the, um, the number of words. So I'm using counts here. Um, <clears throat> then we are doing some uh, topic modeling with LDA. Uh, they give us an example of how we might do that. Um, for the first step, I uh, just did that basically. Uh, and then they introduced this tool called PyL Davis, which is kind of interesting. Uh, it allows you to visualize the, um, your topic model. So uh, you can um, like click on these different classes and see the words that are in them. You could also, uh, you can also scroll through them. So this is kind of interesting. Like, I think part of, you know, what you're, what you're uh, in, a, in an ideal world, at least, you look at these uh, vectors of, you know, this top 20 uh, vector of words from each of the topics, and you kind of clearly get a sense of what that topic is about. Um, this one, not so much. Uh, this one seems to be around like action movies maybe, but this one doesn't seem all that great. Um, alien, star, character. I did something that made my topics, I think what the last thing that I did uh, was, so my first run through of this, I just had the standard uh, function that they, they provided this function and they just had foo as a stop word for some reason, I think to show you where you might add to the stop word list. And I just ran it as, as is and the most, the top two words in pretty much all of the classes were movie and film, which you know don't add a lot of value uh, from a, in, when looking at a movie review. 
uh, <clears throat> data set. So I added those as stop words. Uh, and then I had pretty decent, um, pretty decent topics. Uh, they all had the words like, make, and good in them. Just um, people, you know, saying whether they like the movies or, or good. And I added those as stop words. Uh, probably not a good thing to do from the perspective of the original intent of this data set, which is sentiment analysis, because you're removing a couple of classes or, or words rather that indicate sentiment, but uh, they didn't seem to add a lot of value from a, um, you know, really making the, the topics make sense. Um, so I removed those, and, but the resulting topics I think are less interesting. Um, and so this is the first example you're doing this with uh, 10 topics and then they suggest that you do uh, more topics to see how that looks. Uh, let's see how this one goes. Character story, timeline, scene play, and cop here, cops and robbers, cop movie. Horror movies here, horror, screen, killer, school, scary, summer. Maybe I know what you did last summer, reviews in there somewhere. Um, Sci-fi, special effects. So you can start to see in this version of it, you know, with more topics, you know, some of these are starting to kind of feel intuitive. Um, <clears throat> there is an interesting reference document that I skimmed through um, that talks about the issue of um, kind of pruning your topic models and, you know, kind of massaging them into, um, you know, the things, some of the things that you can do to make them more useful. It's called care and feeding of topic models. Um, and I'm pretty sure I found this via a link in the course materials. Um, but I can put it in the chat just in case I pulled that up somewhere else. Uh, so then, so you've got, you, you do your topic modeling, uh, and then the question six is getting your top words out of the topic models. They provide the a get top words function, and you're basically just iterating uh, through to uh, get the top words for each of your uh, each of your topics. Uh, and then there's a extra credit question here that is looking at using PCA and TSNE to um, create a visualization. That one um, I started but didn't finish, uh, but they do have that in the solutions doc here. Um, so, and I have not even really looked at, at this to try to figure out what it's selling us. Uh, the colors are, I'm not really sure that I can make out more than two colors here, but apparently there are 29 on this chart. I don't, does anyone see more than two colors? I do not. <laughs> Me neither. So, uh, I think I see a face in there. <laughs> I think it's a rabbit. I kind of see, I can see a face here. Like that's the chin line. Are we looking at the same face? I hear a lot of hair off to the side. <laughs> yeah, that's really weird. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right with you. Uh, so I think this is going to be the extra credit for all of us to kind of spend some time looking at this Rorschach test and uh, trying to figure out what it's telling us, trying to figure out what it is telling us, yeah. Um, any questions on the topic modeling case study?
any um, general thoughts on, on topic modeling? Is this anyone um, have experience with uh, doing topic modeling that uh, they can share with us? Does anyone do a lot of NLP work in general? I really haven't done much with NLP. It's one of the areas I really would like to grow in, but just haven't made a leap yet. Same here. Yeah, I wonder if I have, uh, I don't have it nearby. Wait, is this it? Uh, no, that's not it. Um, I did an interview on the podcast with Delip Rao um who um forget the name of his organization organization but he's been active in um kind of building out a community to and a, a challenge to uh, identify deep fakes uh, and he has a book uh by or it's published by o'reilly on nlp that uh is on my it's in my queue um Uh, it's this one. Um, yeah, NLP is one of those topics that uh, I am looking forward to digging into more, particularly like playing around with the transformer models and BERT and some of those things in more detail. Yeah, for some reason, this might just be my perception or just where I'm looking, but it, it seems like uh, working with images and even working with uh, date, you know, traditional data and predictions is really kind of everywhere. But then really good kind of clear resources to approaching starting with NLP, I feel like is just kind of less available. So I appreciate you sharing those resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of... Uh, I think there's a lot of NLP resources. What I think is interesting about NLP is um, there's starting to be kind of this bifurcation where you've got a bunch of stuff that's kind of traditional, like TF-IDF and some of the stuff that we looked at today. And then there's a bunch of stuff that is happening around, you know, deep learning and these, uh, you know, again, like transformer models, GPT-2s, and, and language models in particular, um, that's benefiting from, um, you know, just these massive, massive models. Um, that's kind of interesting, but the space is, the space is, um, I don't know, it's, it's, seems like a big space. There's quite a lot going on in lots of different dimensions. All right, cool. So that was the uh, case study. Um, and that is pretty much what I had for this week's lesson. Any other thoughts or questions or discussion topics? I reserve the right to ask questions on Slack as I finally start to actually do this course. <laughs> Absolutely. Please, please do. Hey, you, you, you ask here, what are you doing as homework? What interesting resources have you found? I think I'm going to spend the next few days. There's so much here, both when we discussed today and then also on the course website. So I'm going to just try and dig through that and then also follow up on Slack if needed. I think I had another couple of interesting resources that I didn't share. So this one, I mentioned there's this application of topic models that uh, I thought was potentially interesting. I did not spend a lot of time on it. Um, and then there was, um, this was another one that they linked to. I forget the context actually, but it looked like an interesting article. Um, on LDA and 
think this one is a example of using LDA in a medical context and then a, kind of a paper that talks about it in more detail. Um, so some interesting, definitely some interesting uh, resources, a lot of resources um, in this section. Um, and that's, uh, you know, again, there's, there's kind of the background papers and then there's uh, a lot of the tool documentation and then some of these Wikipedia pages. So there's definitely plenty to read. Yeah, if, if you can, can you please post that on the GitHub when you do, or just links to them? Just so yeah, sure. Awesome, thanks, Sam. Yep, we'll do. All righty, uh, so next time we'll be moving on to the second week of course three, which um, continues to explore feature engineering. Uh, with modules that dive into outlier detection and clustering. Um, so uh, unless there are any other questions or comments, which you, know, you are welcome to make, uh, I will see you all uh, in Slack and next week. Thanks, Sam. Yep, sounds good. Thanks, Sam. All righty. Have a good one. Have a great weekend. Stay safe.